May the 31st marks the 7th anniversary of the opening of the food bank in Ammerford. Little did we think when we opened uh, that it was going to become such an important and integral part of the community. Year on year it's got busier and busier and this has been even highlighted more uh, during the last couple of months since the crisis began. One of the first consequences of the crisis was that a majority of our volunteers, due to either age and or health, had to self-isolate or shield. And this created a big problem in the short term. Also at that time, shopping became problematic, even to buy the things that we needed ourselves, let alone to buy food for the food bank. Alongside that, of course, the need was growing on a daily basis and more and more people needed our help. So there was a stage where we thought, how on earth are we going to cope with this? And we keep on making the mistake that we do what we do in our own strength, when really we should have learned from experience that as Christians we don't need to. Um, as it says in Luke's Gospel, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And somehow we found solutions to um, those initial problems. Um, a lot of people who, uh, a lot of younger people who were either working from home or uh, had been furloughed came to volunteer at the food bank and we found new ways of working. And this has really worked well over the last two months and we've coped really well with the uh, increase in numbers that we've seen. Since the end of March, I would say that we've at least doubled the number of people that we're feeding. Um, and it's quite humbling to see how many people turn up at the food bank every Friday and the problems that they have. Community support has always been, from day one, one of the most important features of the food bank. And we're very fortunate in Ammerford and area that the community is incredibly supportive never more so than during this pandemic. We are truly humbled to see, um, in, even when food was difficult to come by, how people made up for that by their co financial contributions, individuals and organisations from across our community, um, helped in ways that we can only have imagined beforehand. Uh, and therefore, we have been able to cope with the increase in numbers. Um, you, as we say continually, together we make a difference. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome along to Ammonford Evangelical Church's morning service. Wherever you're connecting from, um, however you've managed to get involved this morning, it's good to have you with us. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Well, if you were here from the very beginning, you'll have caught that video update from the food bank. Really encouraging, isn't it, to be able to see folks from our community, folks from our church, helping those in need at a time like this. You might also have heard my dream quoting those words of Jesus, where he said, everything is possible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Well, let's dwell on those words for a few moments as we begin. Perhaps you've been looking out at the world this week and the sadness of it, the loneliness and the grief of a time like this has really been weighing on your heart. You've been wondering, how can we put this all together again? How can everything sad come untrue? I mean, will it ever happen? Well, we need to hear these words of Jesus that with us, it's impossible, but not with God for all things are possible with God. Maybe it's not the world, but it's your own life that's been weighing on your heart heavily this week. Maybe you're doing great, maybe you're having a wonderful time, but, but maybe you've seen some of the darkness in there. Uh, maybe you felt that failure really keenly. Maybe that sin has been weighing on your heart. Well, you need to hear the words of Jesus this morning that we can't put ourselves together again. We need to come to him and to the one who says all things are possible 
All things are possible with God. How is it possible to have everything put back together again? Well, it's possible because God walked into this world. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to suffer with us and to die for us and then to rise again to new life to give us hope, that hope that far more can be mended than we know. That's the hope that we have today, that the Lord Jesus has walked into this world to give us hope. So let's come before him in prayer. Let's remember these words that however horrible and impossible the situation seems, if we bring it to the Lord Jesus, nothing is impossible with him. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come to you as a good and loving Heavenly Father today. We thank you that you welcome us into your presence. So Lord, we pray as we sing today, as we come before you and pray, as we listen to your words, Lord, we pray that you would teach us, that you'd open our eyes to see more of the Lord Jesus, that you would open our eyes to see ourselves and to see the world for how we really are. Lord, that you would help us to understand reality today. Father, we ask that you would be with us, each one of us, wherever we're listening from. Lord, we pray that you would minister to us, that you would speak to us and that you would change us and stir us up and send us out to serve you and those around us this week. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together now and Reese and Lisa are going to lead us. Good morning, church. Would you join with us this morning in worshipping the Lord? Singing when I survey the wondrous cross. Love so amazing, love so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all.
Does God care? Let me start by asking you a question. How do you show someone that you care about them? How do you expect people to show you that they care about you? Perhaps it's with some special words. When someone says to you when you're suffering a loss, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry for the pain you're going through. Their words comfort us and they show us that they care. Perhaps someone says happy birthday to you when you're celebrating that special day. Their words again show us that they care. But what speaks louder than words are actions. And my guess is that most of us see actions as the ultimate way of proving and being proven to that people care. When we see inactivity, we have to conclude that the other person doesn't care. No present, no card, no hug, nothing like that. Very quickly, we summarise that there is no concern at all involved in that situation. Have you ever been in that situation and you've thought to yourself, God, why aren't you doing anything? Not why are you doing something that I don't like, but why do you seem to be completely and utterly absent from my life? It can be a real personal question. As we're in the pit, as we're walking through the storm, as the pressure cooker builds and the temperature rises around us. It's you, it's God, and it really matters when it seems to us that nothing is happening. Don't you care? We can ask that same question in a far less personal way, but no less important a way. When people tell us stories of things that are happening in our towns and our villages, when we turn on the news and we read stories about things that are happening around the world, we can sit and we can reflect and we can ask the question, doesn't God care about any of this? Surely, if he cared, he'd do something, he'd act. And all we see is nothing. Inactivity. You know, for some people, and this may be you this morning, that inactivity leads them to go a step further. Not only does it generate a frustration within them, um, a, a question to bubble up, does God care about any of this? But actually to go that step further, to get the rubber out and to erase God from history completely. That if he is not acting, then he doesn't even exist. You could be in any one of those places this morning, asking the question from a real personal point of view, asking the question from a slightly detached, more general point of view, or perhaps having given up on the question because you've already decided that God doesn't exist. What can I say to you this morning? Welcome. You are not alone. You're not alone today, you certainly aren't alone throughout human history. People have always asked this question, struggled with this question, wrestled with this question. One of the things we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is seeing how people, even in Jesus' day, ask the sort of question that we ask today. And we're going to get to eavesdrop in on the answers that Jesus gave to the sorts of questions that we still ask right now. This morning we're going to look at a story from Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 4, and it's an occasion in which Jesus' inactivity caused some of his closest friends to question whether he cared about them at all, whether he cared whether they lived, whether he cared if they died. Then we're going to look at how Jesus responded to that situation and see if we can find answers for ourselves. I'm going to hand over to Rosina now, and she's going to read to us from Mark chapter 4, the story of Jesus calming the storm. Thanks, Rosina. And the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, 
and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I'm not sure how many of us have been on a boat in a serious storm. Few perhaps, but not many. Regardless, I think that we can relate. We can feel the terror that must have gripped them. They aren't just uncomfortable, are they? They're fearing for their lives. The wind is howling. The waves are crashing. The boat is rocking and groaning. But not to worry, because they've got someone pretty special with them in the boat. Someone they've already witnessed deal definitively with disease and sickness. Someone that they've already witnessed dismiss disobedient demonic beings. Someone they've already witnessed stare down spiritual death and offer in its place forgiveness and life. He's the same one who invited them to follow him. And not just to follow him on some madcap adventure, but to follow him into full and abundant life. The storm is scary, of course it is, but they travel with Jesus. And that makes all the difference. Except, right now, it doesn't seem to be making any difference at all, does it? As the wind is gathering pace, as each crashing wave gets louder and stronger, this Jesus, who's already done so much in front of their very eyes, he's literally nowhere to be seen. When it looks like push is coming to shove, when the chips are finally down, when words are worthless and actions are worth their weight in gold, when everything is going totally and utterly out of control, Jesus is sleeping. You could not get a better picture of inactivity than that. You could not get a better picture of someone who simply isn't concerned by the circumstances or apparently for his comrades. You can try and create your own story, but you won't get a better picture of how we all feel when the darkness surrounds us, when it presses in on us, and it seems that God is doing absolutely nothing. Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care that we're about to die? Most of us have never been in that boat, but we can relate. We can understand what's going on. Their question is our question, uttered in a thousand different circumstances. Don't you even care just a tiny little bit? Jesus' answer comes in two parts. First of all, Jesus speaks to the storm and then he speaks to the disciples. What does he say to that storm? Hush, be still. And with those simple words, the waves and the wind are silenced and calm. It's amazing actually to see that what is terrifying for his followers is trivial to him. How Jesus treats that storm shows us that inactivity may show many things, but it does not show inability. His lack of intervention wasn't because he was unable to do something about those raging seas. Throughout the Bible, 
those raging seas have been used as a measuring stick for power and authority and control. When humanity comes face to face with them, it's the ultimate symbol of the untamable, the ultimate unknowable. But when God comes face to face with them, well, it's, it's nothing of any concern to him. Take, for example, Psalm 33, a meditation on the majesty, the grandeur, the authority of God. In that psalm, we find this thought. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars and he puts the deep into storehouses. Those are vast oceans in their entirety, not just the localised tempest subduing this small boat, but all of it. To God, they're just like filling up a bottle from a tap. To Jesus, that which causes his followers to presume that there's an impending death, to him it's nothing. Nothing that a word can't dismiss anyway. But ability and power and authority, they're only part of the puzzle because the question wasn't, can you, can you do anything about this? The question was, if we paraphrase it slightly, why on earth aren't you doing something about this? And so we come to his response to the followers, his answer to their question. Don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus says, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? By the time he speaks those words, um, the answer that he gives, he has already acted. He's already dealt with the very thing that had filled them with dread. But I'm still not sure whether his response is that satisfying to us at first glance. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Apparently, Jesus' answer to them and to you and to me, to the question that we ask in testing difficult circumstances, his answer is, why don't you have any faith? According to Jesus, the missing ingredient wasn't his action, but it was the disciples' faith in him. Now for this to be a satisfying answer for us this morning, we need to try and grapple exactly with the question or exactly with the idea of what faith is. I think too often we settle for an idea of faith which is nothing more than blind optimism. Crossing our fingers and wishing for the best. That would mean That Jesus is saying what they really needed to do as the clouds grew thicker and darker overhead was just to close their eyes and wish their wishes. But that idea of faith, blind optimism, it doesn't do justice to the word and it certainly doesn't do justice to the situation that they find themselves in, does it? Later in the New Testament, one of Jesus' followers is going to define faith this way. Faith is assurance or confidence about the unseen. Now, you might not immediately be able to tell the difference between those two definitions, the true definition given there or the false definition that I started with. But when we scratch at the surface a little bit, we, we begin to see how it's something completely and utterly different. The disciple who penned that difference, that true definition, confidence in the unseen, goes on to describe what that looked like in the lives of many of the ancient saints. He cites people like Noah, like Abraham, like Sarah, like Samuel, like David, These weren't people who blindly hoped for the best. These were all people who had already heard 
who had already seen something of God, what his promises were for them, how he keeps his promises. They'd seen it, they'd experienced it for themselves. And that allowed them to keep their hope in the fulfilment of promises even before they'd come to pass. Faith then, confidence in the unseen, isn't foundless, it isn't blind, it isn't simply wishing for the best, but it's responding to what God has already revealed. There's something about experiencing God in one moment and trusting him in the next that we can call faith. When Jesus answered his disciples then, where is your faith? We need to remember that they had already seen so much. He'd already promised to love them and care for them and to lead them into life. So faith in their present darkness, in their present storm, would have been continuing to hang on to the light that they'd already received. Don't you care? they asked. And Jesus might as well have answered, I've already told you and shown you that I do. Jesus responded to the storm. He responded to the disciples. Let's take a moment now to think about how he is responding or what he is saying to us. We weren't on that boat and presumably our fears are being stalked by something different altogether. We've never come face to face with Jesus and his miracles or heard from his very lips the sorts of promises those disciples had heard. So what on earth can he be saying to us in this situation? You know, I think our gut response is right. That for us to know that somebody cares, we need to see action. Someone can say certain things, but unless it's followed up, then ultimately it means nothing. You do prove to someone that you care through the things that you do. Words are a starting point, but action is what really seals the deal. And if you read your way through Mark's Gospel, through the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, you discover that he made promises not just to the people who followed him, but to anyone who would follow him. Whoever loses their life because of me will save it, Jesus said. Whoever gives up everything to follow me will make it back a hundredfold. Jesus said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Those weren't just words spoken to a niche gang in Israel, wandering around with their rabbi. These are words that are extended as an offer to each and every one of us, and they were backed up by action. You see, Jesus acted once and definitively for all of those who would follow him. He backed up everything he said by going to the cross and dying before rising to life again. Jesus acted in dying in our place and as rising as our precursor. We sit in a place in a time when we can look back on all of that and know without a shadow of a doubt that he does care. More than that, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that he does love us. Faith, for us then, is being certain of that. And because we're certain of that, being certain of what is to come. Faith for us is trusting on the in-between. What terrifies us may be trivial for Jesus, but that doesn't mean it's unimportant. What's immediate to us isn't being ignored by him. Perhaps there's waiting, perhaps there's unnoticed action, but there's certainly not a lack of care or concern or love. You can confidently come to Jesus with your question, don't you care? 
and know that Jesus' answer is, you know that I care. You've seen that I care. Now trust me through it all. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a caring God. You are an acting God. You are a powerful God. You are an everything God to us in Jesus. Lord, we don't like it when the storm clouds come. Lord, we don't like it when the darkness wraps itself around us. But we know that the light has come into the world. We know that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again in our place. Lord, give us the eyes to see the unseen. Give us faith to see and to trust in what he has already done. Lord, let that build up, let that bubble up inside of us to have faith and confidence in what he will do. Lord, and help that be an answer to us in our darkness, in our distress, in our suffering and our hurting, as we cry out the question, don't you care to know? Yes, he does. Unquestionably, he cares for us. He is acting, he will act, and that we can trust him always. Amen.
Join this morning with millions across the world to pray, to give you thanks, our Father God. We come to praise you, for you are good and your love endures forever. We come from this little corner of our land to give you, our Father, grateful thanks for your unfailing love. We praise you that you are not confined to a building or church, that you don't need YouTube or Zoom, you are in every home and every situation with your people. And yet we thank you for the technology that brings us together. We pray for every home, every person, every family represented, connected one with the other and joined to you, our Father, through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who are sick this morning and weak or worried, we pray they will prove the love of Jesus and the comfort of his peace. We pray for those who tend and care for the sick and the weak. And we pray for those who are seeking to know the love of Jesus and those who try to show his love. We also pray for the food bank in Ammonford where you have given strength and perseverance for seven years to reach out to help others in our community. We thank you that the work continues through these days of confinement. And we ask your blessing and those 
on those who come for food and for those who work there. We see your love at work in so many places and situations at this time. We see evidence of a selfless desire to help others and ask, O oh Lord, that many will come to value the selfless and perfect love of Jesus who gave himself for us. As the pandemic shows how little control we have over viruses, we give praise that you, O oh Lord, are in control. Your Lord of heaven and earth, your ways are beyond our understanding, but we know we can rely on your goodness and love in all things. Be with those who are lonely. Covia o dad, am a miloid na da ditan gaki gwel teili a fintiai. Kasira hoi ath gumni. Derbi ninnai, a gunani in vui tebi di etsi. To you, our Father, in Jesus, we pray and commit this day and all our days to you. For your glory. Amen. 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 Well, we're just about the end of our time together this morning. So I wanted to say thank you to you for joining us. And thank you to all of those who've taken part, who've given time to put this all together this week. I hope it's been an encouragement and a help to you this morning. And perhaps it's been pretty new to some of us who are tuning in. Perhaps um, Christianity is all a bit new and you'd like to find out a little bit more. It's kind of interesting. It sounds like it might be good news, but you still have a lot of questions. Well, if that's you, then we have something we call Christianity Explored going on at the moment. And there's still time to get involved if you'd like to. What we do is basically go through a, a bit of the Bible. It's one of the biographies of Jesus, a book called Mark. It's the book that that quotation at the very beginning of the service came from, where Jesus says nothing is impossible with God. We look at that story, one of the biographies of Jesus, and kind of work our way through it, just bit by bit, over, well, it'll be the next five weeks. We gather together on Zoom, read and watch a little video and discuss it together. Um, so if you would like to get involved with that, if that sounds like something that might be up your street, then you can comment on Facebook or on YouTube, let us know and we'll get back to you. Or you can head over to our website and use the contact form, give us your details and we'd love to connect you with that. Well, as we go, let me read to you these words of God's blessing over his people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Amen.